Uh, so there's not um, much of a difference in the theme this week. Um, it continues. Uh, part, uh, sorry, Proverbs 1 to 9 was a set of Proverbs in itself. Um, and that was, uh, and Proverbs 9 was the last one that we did in that section. Proverbs 10 to 22, and, and don't worry about the, how much it we're covering today, uh, chapters 10 to 22, it seems like a lot. Uh, it's not. I'm, I'm I've particularly this time picked out, uh, a, hopefully, a, a, a theme running through the whole lot. And we're only really picking out a few verses today. Um, but this is the reason why is because 10 to 22 are the Proverbs of Solomon. Here's the ones that he wrote, um, that we know that he wrote. Uh, that we, we also say that he obviously wrote the other ones. However, we know for sure that these are the Proverbs of Solomon. Um, and so I've named this pure heart in a fallen world. Um, these are what they might call Proverbs proper. So we have Proverbs and they're just as equal. But Proverbs proper <clears throat> is, is actually attributed to King Solomon. And he provides uh, these word pictures of the way in which God designed the world to work under his governing authority. So if you read, you take the time afterwards to read these chapters, it tells you how God set up. The governing authority of the world how it all works it doesn't mean he approves of it it doesn't mean he likes it it's just that that's the way it works we've just been told this is what people do and this is what people don't do this is how the world works and this is how it doesn't work and what we'll see is we'll understand the wise who seek to understand and live within god's design in day-to-day -day life but we'll see that the fool ignores or shuns this wise path and this section shows that wisdom is necessary and available for every arena of our lives and our relationships. These chapters show how those who live in the fear of the Lord, and we're going back to this again, the fear of the Lord, really important, are blessed and how foolish are the cursed. And so today we'll look at these chapters and cover three main points. Uh, one is the fountain of life, which has four aspects, which I'll tell you about, and that's related to the living water, if you will. The warning of misfortune uh, we'll look at and then the reward of a pure heart. And they, uh, I think they all connect together. I think I've, I've managed to uh, see a thread through it. So we'll have a look at that uh, and see what, what uh, the Bible wants to teach us on these things. So let's, let's first look at the fountain of life. As we look into this section, we find there's four aspects of wisdom that make the fountain of life. These Four aspects can help us to understand the spiritual meaning, not just here, but the spiritual meaning behind what Jesus said to the Samaritan woman at the well. And in particular, this is helpful to understand that. And we see this John 4, uh, verse 13 to 14. Uh, I've called this first one is called a righteous tongue, the first aspect of a fountain of life. To have the fountain of life uh, is a righteous tongue. So Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water, will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. This account, if you read further into the uh, woman at the well, uh, the Samaritan woman of Jesus, does actually contain, I think, the four aspects of the fountain of life. So our first verse, to understand a righteous tongue, Proverbs 10, verse 11 the mouth of the righteous is a fountain of life, but the mouth of the wicked conceals violence. The mouth of the righteous is a fountain of life. You'll see that repeated a couple of times as well. So they're fundamental aspects of what of how we need to be as Christians. How do we behave and, and glorify God in our living day to day? What is first needed to receive the fountain of life is a righteous tongue. <clears throat> Excuse me. In these days, we can find it, I think, all too easy uh, to let our mouth do the talking, to let our mouth go off without our brain engaging. It can start speaking whilst our heart sits in passive compliance, watching as the mouth rattles off in anger or in rage or in or whatever. And we've seen that. We see it in just basic road rage on the road. We see all sorts of uh, examples in that as well. The wicked man or woman brings harm and hurt with their words. They take away life. It says here that the mouth of the wicked conceals violence. 
not only uh, trying to describe that their mouth is wicked, but actually what it speaks of is of their heart, which I'll get onto as well. What comes out of that is a worse thing, not only words, but uh, worse things are hiding in the heart that the mouth is speaking of. Maybe not always obvious, but... <coughs> Clear my throat. Um, <coughs> but, but, what we learned last week was that bitter, I think it was stolen water, uh, was good or tasted good or and food eaten in secret and something uh, is is all is all feels good at the time i think this is the same case here an unrighteous tongue it feels good to unleash to let off at people um, but bitter and sweet water doesn't come from the same well as we're seeing here in the uh in the verses in uh, the the woman at the well we're seeing that actually the water that jesus is providing is sweet is of good value good quality in fact it will give us eternal life jesus told the woman if she drank of the water he provided she would never thirst again life everlasting comes with the mouth so a righteous man or woman speaks life-giving words most often to others or to each other as a church but sometimes to ourselves we need to say good edifying things from the bible we need to see what god is saying in his word let me say this though people take these sorts of principles too far and we need to be careful uh we don't create anything with the words we say but we need to be really uh really um particular about this as a there's a thing going around in churches all over the world uh, where there's an understanding that you can speak things into life and the reason for that, the theology, and the terrible theology that it is, says that because you are made by God, because Holy Spirit lives within you, you have the same power as God to speak things into being. I'm going to tell you, you don't. No one has any power apart from God. No one has any gift apart from God. But these are things we can simply fall into, mainly because actually we're in this new age time. Or actually, that sounds quite good. That sounds like really edifying and it, and it encourages me. I can speak things into life. Only God can raise and God can kill. God can put to death. We have no power apart from Jesus. But the only way these wise words can come is if the Lord is the source of this fountain. And so is our source. It springs up in the wise man and woman <clears throat> has wise speech wise laws the fear of the lord and understanding you probably would have had an experience where you know your mouth has has told on you where it's revealed who you are where you've really gone completely unhinged forgot about your that moment that you need before you open your mouth. And in those moments, it can really tell on us. It can reveal either a great depth of sorrow and rage. And our mouths are especially good at telling on us. Without engaging our heart, without engaging our heads first. We have seen this before, Matthew 15, verse 18. That the things that come out of a person's mouth come from the heart. And these defile them but this means that if we can hear ourselves if we can take notice of what we are saying and understand how our words reveal who we are it means we can do something about it for the same mouth that speaks from the same heart things that defile can also speak of a heart turned to christ proverbs 12 verse 14 from the fruit of their lips people are filled with good things and the work of their hands brings them reward. Romans 10 verse 9. If you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart. God raised him from the dead. You will be saved. The mouth speaks of the heart's intention. The mouth gives voice to the heart. And it can either defile or declare that Jesus is Lord. 
So how do we get to that point where we can declare Jesus is Lord? How can we speak this genuinely? Let's look at the second aspect of the fountain of life, which is wise teaching. <clears throat> Let me take a drink. <clears throat> The teaching of the wise is a fountain of a fountain of life, turning a person from the snares of death. God's word, the law of the wise, is a continual source of life for all who will receive it. We see that God's rules that wise men live by bring everlasting life. We listen to God's instructions. Not only are we promised uh, life eternal, but it helps us now. John said that Jesus is the word and that word became flesh. John 1 verses 1 to 2 says in the beginning, sorry, it's 3 I've got there actually. Uh, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was with God in all the beginning, in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. Verse 14, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. The word is not only for our understanding and knowledge, it is the very means by which we understand how we are saved and by whom. God's word is our source for continuing to live in this life now but also for our very salvation after death. It is both the living water for the life being lived and the life after. It is for now and forever. So this word of God, both written and living, deserves more than just to be stored in our brains. It deserves more than just to be stored there for the sake of simply memorising it. <clears throat> It should remind us of the God who wrote it. It should tell us who he is. And in that regard, so the third aspect is the fear of the Lord. Proverbs 14, verse 27, the fear of the Lord is a fountain of life, turning a person from the snares of death. We might think that fear always leads to less life. But that isn't how it works with the fear of the Lord. Proper fear of the Lord is rooted in understanding who God is and who we are in relation to him. That itself is like a fountain of life. Matthew 10 verse 28. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. I just meant to say the fear of the Lord at the top, by the way. It didn't quite fit on the screen. You see, what we're being told is we can live this life to its fullest, knowing that we don't have to be afraid of what happens to this body or this life. We're free from the lie of the devil that killing our body ends our life. Do you ever wonder why people behave the way they do when they don't want to believe in Jesus. Underneath whatever they say, even if they say they're not scared, the one thing that drives it the most, I believe, is the fear of death. Because when you have to think about Jesus, when you have to think about what your life really means in this context, in this world and into eternity, then you have to think about death. Then you have to think about what happens after you die. And so what do people do instead? They worship this life now. They want to do everything in this life. Don't think about death. Don't think about what happens afterwards. And sometimes the reason for that is foolish. It's simply because, well, I don't know. But there's a book that tells you, and you can know. People are scared of death. People are frightened of death. And so if they lash out, if they, if they hate what we believe, 
because they hate Jesus, it's because they're scared of death. For those that know Jesus, the empty lie of the devil has no hold or power over us. Instead, we can live our lives in freedom because of this strange paradox. If we are afraid of the one who can kill both soul and body, then I'll have more, not less life. How is that? Here's how it works. I know that the all-powerful God of the Bible can end my life altogether and send me to hell through my own foolishness. But I know something else which God provided so he would not have to. He provided Jesus. I'm in fear of God because he can guarantee the choice I make and make it happen. I can choose to go to hell and he'll make it happen. I can choose to go to heaven and he'll make it happen. He can guarantee that if I choose to be against him, then I'll be against him forever in hell for eternity. Or he can guarantee that if I choose to be for him, then I'll be with him forever in heaven for eternity. The reason why God does that is because he doesn't go back on his promises. The reason why we, can, we don't have to live in the fear of man, the fear of the world, is because I know that if I believe in Jesus, Jesus pays back on the promise. He says, if you believe in me, you will be saved. That's a promise. So I don't have any more fear anymore of this world because actually I've trusted in God who said, if you do this, I will pay back on the promise. I will make it real, make it so. That's how we can have confidence. That's why we live in this strange paradox of fear of the Lord. But I'm, I'm in fear of the Lord because I know he, can, he will carry out exactly what he promised. Either I'm going to be with him because I trust in him or I will go to hell because I don't. So which one am I going to choose? Oh, it's like banging your head against the wall. Come on, people. Even if you don't know, and I don't necessarily agree with the theology behind this, even if you don't know what's going to happen, isn't it better just to trust that there's a God? Isn't it better to trust that God exists, that Jesus died for sin and rose again, and you did nothing for that gift? Before we even get into our lives changing, before we even get into maturity and growing as a Christian, oh, if the choice is just what it is, why would you choose a terrible choice? Why would we go to hell instead of heaven? So the theology of saying... Just in case, let me even go there. Let me say, look, even, even if that's your reasoning, just in case I'm going to believe in God, just in case there's a heaven, just in case there's a hell. Got to start somewhere. Just in case, just believe in God, just in case. Do you know what that is? That's an open heart. That's someone opening themselves and going, I'm going to, I'm going to look at what this is. I'm going to say, there might well be. There might well be heaven. There might well be hell. What have I got to lose by exploring those options? Nothing. I'm going to die anyway. We're all going to die off this, off this planet. We're all going to, if for unbelievers, we're going to end up somewhere or nowhere, according to some. So to understand that we need to choose God, we need good sense. And that's the fourth aspect of the fountain of life. Proverbs 16, 22, prudence is a fountain of life to the prudent, but folly brings punishment to fools. This is like a really simple proverb. In other words, have some good sense. Cautiousness is a fountain of life to the cautious, but foolishness brings punishment to fools. I mean, is it, it's that simple, isn't it? Prudence means cautiousness or being cautious. Folly is foolishness. 
It's one of those ones that's self-explanatory. It just tells you what it is. When it comes to the being something, in this case, hopefully prudent, you act out what that something is. You're prudent. Being cautious means you apply cautiousness to every decision. Being a fool means you're foolish in every decision. Not only will it bring a foolish outcome in this life, it brings punishment in eternity. The woman at the well was very cautious. When she spoke to Jesus, she was very cautious. She was careful in a conversation with him to begin with. Jesus slowly revealed who he was through things that only a prophet would know. Only an all-knowing God would know. Only things that the Samaritan woman would know herself. So she kept questioning and exploring who this man was until she was sure. She was cautious, but wise. Even after she ran off telling everyone in the town, she still said, could this be the Messiah? I don't think Jesus would find anything wrong with that. And by the way, I think that's totally planned. There's a time when Jesus was going to reveal himself and it wasn't quite there yet. Could this be the Messiah? Is that a lot to ask? Could this Jesus that we read in the Bible be real? Can we have a conversation about it without biting each other's heads off? Says Proverbs. I think this cautiousness, this prudence, requires us to be aware of God and test everything against his way. And I think prudence can be summed up in this way. Romans 12, verse 2 to 4. It says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Encapsulated in that is cautiousness, careful, test, weigh up everything. It goes on. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. The living water is what we need if we're to be wise in our walk. The fountain of life is what we need if we are to be wise. We need it to avoid this snare or trap of death that awaits every single person. It awaits those who are too easily fooled by the enemy. The enemy comes in many forms. In this particular place, I would say, in this area, we're particularly fooled by wealth, by things, by things that make us feel like we've got everything, that we've got security, that we've got hope in things. The enemy is very clever at using those things to give us a false sense of security. And so I think this leads nicely on to our second main point. The warning of misfortune. So we, we, we've understood the fountain of life and its four aspects. And now what we're going to do is help each other, help us understand of Proverbs 18, 23, 19, 4. says the poor plead for mercy, but the rich answer harshly. One who has unreliable friends soon becomes to ru succumbs to ruin. But there's a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Better the poor whose way of life is blameless than the fool whose lips are perverse. Desire without knowledge is not good. How much more will hasty feet miss the way? A person's own folly leads to their ruin, yet their heart rages against the Lord. Wealth attracts many friends, but even the closest friend of the poor person deserts them. Oh, how many times have even we but many people in the world raged against the Lord, blamed him for their lot, and yet go back to what they believe and they don't even believe God exists. How could God do this? 
If there's a God, how can he do this to me? We are really good as human beings at trying to avoid accountability. We're really good at trying to avoid the repercussions of our own decisions. Because we don't want to blame ourselves. It's not our fault we did that. It's not our fault we made that choice. But it is our fault we made that choice. And yet we still go, or people will still go, my heart rages against the Lord. How can he do this to me? When a person is poor in money or influence, as we're seeing in these verses, all they can do is beg for favour and justice. The rich man or woman can speak boldly, even rudely, because they have resources of money and influence. We pray for our government because we don't want them to get tied up in making money off the back of other people. We want them to lead our country well. We want them to do it in a way that honours God. We want them to serve the poor, to help the poor, because that creates a better society for everybody. What we don't need is the use of money and influence as some form of looking down or pushing down on those who have nothing. Solomon in these verses describes the world as it is, not as it should be. We sense that in this proverb a, a quiet plea to make a better world than what is described in the proverb. And so when we look at this rich versus poor, humility is represented by the poor and arrogance is represented by the rich. That's not to say, by the way, that it's necessarily picking out people with a lot of money that always are like this. There are good Christians, good servants of the Lord who have much wealth. But I, I, I remember hearing about this, about how do, you, how do we get out of that mindset and, and not, not focus on wealthy people being of the devil or something, or being those who are just trying to get Christians or not never believers. It's this, and this is, I think this is really wise words when I heard this sermon. He said, if God hasn't given you tons of wealth, one of the reasons might be is because he knows it will corrupt you. If he's given wealth to people, it's because he knows, and it is still a struggle, but he knows ultimately it won't corrupt you. He knows the deep heart of every single person. He knows the capability of every single person. He knows what our vices are, he knows what we can fall to. For some it is money, for others it isn't. So here, just to be sure, we're not picking out rich people as all unbelieving and all sinners and heretics and terrible people, okay? We're just using this as a, a kind of what they call a literary device. We're trying to understand extremes. How do people who don't believe, people who do believe? Using this example of poor and rich. So, the person who makes friends does so too easily and indiscriminately and does so to his own destruction. That's what we'll find with the rich. Whereas the humble will mostly make more sincere friends. Even so, both the humble and the arrogant are warned that friends are not always all they are cracked up to be. The rich get friends, mostly, only because of their wealth. And so they're not really friends. We see that as an, even an example on Facebook. I would imagine that most people who really use Facebook, they're not really friends with them. You make friends, you, you say we're friends by clicking a button, but you're not friends. Friends, you get together with them, you meet with them, you, you, you enjoy their company, you talk to them, you, you share some of your life with them. Facebook has compromised this word friend. It's, it's made it cheap. Friends of the poor, equally they're at risk. Or the poor person is at risk. 
you might find that it's likely that friends of the poor, as we see here, will abandon them because they'll grow weary and tired of their poverty. The rich person is hurrying to go nowhere. A term I like to use, and I've used this very often, uh, we often uh, talk about this, Min Dong, but um, busy work. You know what busy work is? Busy work is when you don't really have any work to do, but you find something to do that produces nothing. Yeah? Keeps you busy. Busy work. And this is particularly, I think, not every single rich person, not every single wealthy person, But I think if you have lots of money, you don't have a need for anything. What else is there except nothing busy work? What else do you do when, when life's problems in that sense have been addressed? Certainly in a worldly sense. We're probably talking about this kind of mega rich here, aren't we? The mega wealthy. They've got people to do every single thing for them. You can only you can watch these lifestyle programs of all these different celebrities. And they've got people to do everything. Every single thing in their life. So what, they have to find stuff to do that doesn't do anything. They're rushing to go nowhere. But here it is. Even if the poor man has nothing in possession, nothing, no friends, he has integrity. He walks in his integrity. He lets us know in this example that he's not willing to gain the world's goods by any means necessary, any means possible, by hook or by crook. He is satisfied in the state that he has found himself in. in. He will follow Jesus whatever state he is in. We know that Paul, if you look at the writings of Paul, you will see Paul has been to uh, great riches and into great poverty. And yet the one thing he held on to was Jesus. None of those things actually made him happy. Even to be wealthy didn't make him happy. To be poor didn't necessarily make him happy. But what made him satisfied was Jesus. So we need the friend who sits closer than a brother. Jesus Christ himself who called us no longer servants but friends. John 15, 14 to 15. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants. Because a servant does not know his master's business. He said I've called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father I have made known to you. And after a long time I try and, I try and space these out. I've got a good Spurgeon quote. He says, now I have a question to ask. That question I ask of every man and every woman in this place and of every child too, is Jesus Christ your friend? Have you a friend at court, at heaven's court? Is the judge of quick and dead your friend? Can you say that you love him? And has he ever revealed himself in the way of love to you? Dear hearer, do not answer that question for thy neighbour. Answer it for yourself. Peer or peasant, rich or poor, learned or illiterate, this question is for each of you, therefore ask it, is Christ my friend? By the way, your answer should be yes. And I think Spurgeon's own words lead us into the final main point of today. Reward of a pure heart. Proverbs 22 verse 11. He who loves purity of heart and whose speech is gracious will have the king as his friend. In the Sermon uh, on the Mount in Matthew 5, Jesus says in Matthew 5 verse 8, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. We've seen earlier that the words that come from our mouths originate in our heart. 
we would see this in, we we would see in this verse that these words would be pure because they come from a pure heart inner purity often shows itself through grace filled words these two are marks of godly wise men and women this true godliness and wisdom both on the inside and in spoken words will make friends in high places Maybe take the S off that. It will make a friend in the most high place. It will certainly contribute to ongoing fellowship with God. And so such a person, such people, walk in the light as God is in the light. 1 John 1 verse 6 to 7 says, If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we are honest with God about who we are and the sin we do, we will continue to walk in the light. If we deny our sin but still claim that we have fellowship with Jesus, we are lying to ourselves, but we are also most importantly lying to god and we do not live in his truth in that sense we do not live in his truth about who we are and why we need him so it's simply to be honest with god even as we might have sinned against him we come to him because he's made a way to come back to be forgiven so we're honest and say i, I did this he knows you've done it he knows we do things sometimes that we do sin but the acknowledgement is important that we tell the truth to him, that we say to him, I admit, I've done that. That way we're not, we're not denying it to ourselves. We're not pretending. Being pure of heart is not about trying to be good people. Being pure of heart is about honesty and integrity before God. If you want to be a friend of Jesus, then all he asks for is to be honest. If we sin before a holy God, be honest with him. He's right there. And he will forgive. Say it with your lips so to no longer harbour the darkness in our hearts. James says what John says. James 4 verse 8, draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Both these verses are telling us don't be double-minded. Don't try and be both things. Because there is a way that even if you feel like God's not impressed with you, that's okay because actually Jesus made a way. You're not impressive. Jesus is impressive. So that's why we go through him because we cannot stand in front of a holy God. And say, I am holy and unblemished. So we need Jesus. And that's why he's put him there. That's why he made that way. You don't need to be double-minded. We don't need to be double-minded anymore. You just need to be honest. So how do we draw near to God? How do we cleanse our hearts, purify our hearts? John again tells us, 1 John 1 verse 9, if we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive. Do you know why he does that? Because he promised it and he carries out what he promises. You might think this is really simple, but people overcomplicate this. Non-believers complicate this. If I confess my sin, he's got to do what he said he was going to do always, which was to forgive us and save us. God cannot go back on his word. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us. From all unrighteousness. If we confess our sin, our reward is that we will have a pure heart. Not because we're really impressive, but because God will keep his promise through Jesus Christ. He is faithful because God has set up a way so that if we genuinely confess our sin to him, he has no other choice but to forgive us. Because he's not given himself another choice. 
God has made that way happen. This is how it works. God cannot tell a liar or go back on what he has accomplished through Jesus. So here it is. Let me sum this up. Use the four aspects of the fountain of life. A righteous tongue, pursue wise teaching, live life to its full in the fear of the Lord. And have some good sense, church. This will keep us from ruin and misfortune. It will keep us from going down that ruined path, that ruined road that leads to destruction. And only as we pursue the fountain of life, the living water that is Jesus Christ, will we desire to continually embrace the reward of a pure heart and so be sanctified by it. For the rest of our lives as we pursue the living water in Jesus Christ, he will continually teach us to change, to grow to mature, to be more like him. I'm going to pray and then we'll worship as we finish today.